YouTube. In today's video, we are going to be doing an overview of the books of 1st John, 2nd John, and 3rd John. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to ask you to please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. The author of 1st John is not specifically named in the book. The recipients are also not specifically mentioned within the text. We do know from the very first verse that the author was an apostle because it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. 1 John is written with authority, and it is recognized as being written by John, the son of Zebedee, according to the early church father's tradition. It is interesting to note that the vocabulary and literary style does very closely resemble that to, uh, of the book of John. Furthermore, the fiery statements against Antichrist, liars, and children of the devil fit Jesus' description of John's mouth when it, he was described in Mark chapter 3, verse 17, as one of the sons of thunder. <laughs> the authority is endearingly familiar with the intended recipients because he refers to them as my little children in chapter 2, verse 1. I mean, really? Aren't all adults just big children from God's perspective? Even if we were to live to a hundred years old, imagine yourself at 10 years old. That's only 10 of those. Life is very short, friends. First John is written in a way that suggests an older, more mature apostle is, addre is addressing a group of Christians, possibly in Asia Minor where John spent a lot of time. It's interesting also to note that Arrhenius thought that John lived in Ephesus. So that is a possibility for who the original audience could have been as well. John wrote this letter to combat Gnostic teachings, which was attacking and infesting itself in the church at every corner. Gnosticism was a mixture of Eastern mysticism and Greek dualism, which taught that the spirit is good and matter is evil. Therefore, Jesus Christ was not fully human. Gnostics promoted the, her the heresy that either Jesus only seemed to have a body, which is docetism, or that the Holy Spirit descended on the man Jesus when he was baptized and left him before he died, which is Serinthianism, both of which are lies from the pit of hell. John had a double purpose for writing 1 John. The first was to expose the gross error of the false teachers in chapter 2, verse 26, and the second was to clarify the true gospel, which will give Christians assurance in chapter 5, verse 13. First John has an extreme amount of relevance for us as the church today, as it defines the true gospel, defends Jesus' deity and humanity, that Jesus is both fully God and fully man, and defines what salvation is. First John has the feel of a sermon, but without any introduction. <laughs> I hear a lot of pastors today doing a long introductions full of polls and barn of poll references, but then they say that they don't have time to address a certain issue that leaves a question to be begged. First John does not have that problem, as John just packs his audience with pure, unwatered down truth. John gives us three tests of faith. John gives us three tests of faith. Obedience to God's law love for God and his people, and correct beliefs about who Jesus Christ is and his work on the cross. While presenting this checklist, John exposes the false teachings that have infiltrated the church. First John gives us a self-test to make sure that we are actually in the faith that we claim to, to be in, and it is good for every believer to run through every now and then just to make sure that we have not taken a wrong turn somewhere in our journey. John ends with the reminder of the reliability of God's word and an admonition to pray. First John is a pot of gold for us as the modern church because we are experiencing persecution and it is only going to get worse, my friends, as things amp up into the future leading to the final showdown between good and evil. We are bombarded with false teachings today as they were then and there will never be a generation that will escape these things. I would encourage a congregation uh, or a church 
the congregation of the church, I would encourage the church to do a checklist to make sure that they are indeed in the fail in the faith. And if we fail the test, then to get back on track, repent and return to our first love, Jesus Christ. I would also point out that the theme of love is found throughout the whole letter of 1 John, which is desperately needed in the church today. So now let's move on to the book of 2 John. 2 John also does not explicitly say who wrote it, but it does express the original audience in the very first verse where it says, The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth. Elders were respected in this culture because of wisdom. So John just assumed the simple affectionate title rather than presenting his credentials as an apostle. The style of 1 John and 2 John are very similar, which leads me to believe that they were indeed written by the same author, John. He probably wrote this letter from Ephesus pretty quickly after writing 1 John. 2 John is postmarked to the elect lady and her children. Scholars have been butting heads over the identity of the recipients, which has resulted in two main possibilities. John could have written to a particular woman, which legitimately addresses her Christian children in verse 4. The greeting from her sister's children in verse 13, and the references that are plural with 2 John, such as verses 6, 8, 10, and 12. The other camp in the debate points out that it is very appropriate to refer to the church body using a feminine word as described in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 27, and Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. After all, Jesus refers to the church as his bride. This would explain why John did not address anyone by their actual name in 2 John, which he does in 3 John, as we will see coming up. In this case, the children would be the church members, and the greetings from her sister's children would be members of a church at a different location. Furthermore, all all of the plural references would be members of the church too. These differences of opinions don't matter because the message is the same either way. John's point is to guard against false teachings and to always stand on the truth and the authority of God's word over man's word. False teachers were a major problem in the early church, as they are today, which makes 2 John extremely relevant and useful to teach in our pulpits. The primary problem 2 John speaks to is the heresy that disputed the nature of Jesus Christ. False teachers were traveling into the churches to spread their blasphemous teachings like cancer. Worse is that some churches were giving them hospitality and a platform in which to spread these false teachings. This reminds pastors today to be very careful who they invite to be a guest speaker or become a leader of a small group within the church. We must monitor people's doctrine with a microscope to avoid infiltration by false teachers. 2 John was written to warn the church to use discernment and to shun those with false teachings. John was loving and concerned about the church's well-being, like a parent who expects inspects all of their children's candy before letting them eat it. Second John is very brief, but it is packed, stuffed, full of gold nugget after gold nugget. John closes in the second to the last verse by saying, Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. John gives a quick greeting, a commendation, instructions on how to deal with false teachers, and ends with a promise to visit them in person. The principles that we can take from 2 John today are enormous because we need to be cautious with what people teach us. You know, so many times somebody presents us with a PhD and we just believe what they say is truth and we nod our heads, okay. Uh, no, not okay. Any Bible teacher worth his title will tell you to double-check everything that they say with what the Bible says. We are reminded of the dangers of unorthodox, hybrid, and innovative teachings on the cutting edge of heresy in 2 John. I am reminded that the fight against false teachings has always been a problem and always will be until Jesus returns. I would comfort the sheep by reminding them 
that the God who got the early church through false teachings will also get us through the battle as well. I would also remind people, you, to double, triple, quadruple everything that I say with the word of God. And if the word of God says something different than what I'm saying, go with the word of God because I'm just another person. So now let's move on to the book of 3 John. 3 John is titled as being written by the elder who we just learned was John. The very first verse also identifies the original reader who was Gaius, where John writes, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Gaius was probably a leader in a church somewhere in Asia Minor. Third John gives us a snapshot of the many headaches and challenges that plagued the early church. First, second, and third John were probably all written from Ephesus almost simultaneously, one right after the other. Again, John was writing to Gaius, of whom this is a first mention, but was obviously a leader in the early church. John talks very candidly with Gaius about the inhospitable actions of a problem person in church leadership whose name was Diotrephus. John demonstrates the great care that he has for the church. In 1st and 2nd John, he refers to them as the elect lady. Hot air balloonists and car enthusiasts usually name their beloved items in the feminine. Jesus names his beloved church in the feminine, his bride. This means that the church was John's beloved baby, and he cherished her because of Jesus as his most important treasure and demonstrated the care and commitment to her that only a father can offer. The main problem or issue John was dealing with in 3 John was hospitality for traveling missionaries. Demetrius evidently treated one of these missionaries in a very bad way. John wanted to remind Gaius that fellowship and hospitality among believers was crucial. This letter was instructional, brought light to and exposed a problem person, and ends up with an expressed hope to visit in person. John opens up with a greeting, commends Gaius, condemns the actions of Diotrephus, and then promises to correct him upon his arrival. Third John is packed with recommendations and good wishes. The principle we can take away from Third John today is that hospitality amongst believers is very, very important. I would teach the sheep to show kindness to everyone, especially their family in Christ. We are all partners on the same team as Christians, and we need to be able to rely on each other for encouragement and everyday practical support. Thank you for watching. Please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel, and I hope to see you in the next video.